Practical Farmers of Iowa Farminar. I'm Steve Carlson. I work with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, tonight's Farminar topic, as you know, uh, is on tax preparation. And we've got two very knowledgeable speakers who have got a lot of content to cover tonight. First, we're going to have Matt Russell, and, and he and his husband own and operate Coyote Run Farm down in Warren County. And, uh, and Matt also works at Drake University's Agricultural Law Center. So Matt will be drawing from both his farming experience and his work uh, with Drake's Ag Law Center. And then uh, joining Matt tonight is Christine Tidgren, who is an attorney and agricultural tax specialist at ISU's Center for Agricultural Law and Taxation. So between the two of these, we've got a lot of expertise. And um, uh, before I turn it over here to Matt, though, I'm going to say a few things about Practical Farmers of Iowa and our uh, Farm in Our series. So this is what we call our fall Farm in Our series. And you can see the next three dates in this fall series um, with the topics and presenters. And then we'll take a couple breaks, a couple weeks off for a break around Christmas and start again on uh, January 10th with another 12 weeks of Farm in Our. So we'll announce those topics uh, right at the beginning of the year, so stay tuned to that. Also, we do record all of these farminars and we put them in our archives, so if you ever want to rewatch re -watch them or if you have to miss one, um, after a couple days, uh, once the farminar is over, we will have it in our farminar archive, so check that out. And there are hundreds of, or well, well over a hundred farminars in that archive, so check it out. Use the search button for anything um, that you're interested in. So about Practical Farmers of Iowa, uh, we did start back in 1985 as a nonprofit, and we're made up of farmers at that time who were interested in, in bringing back diversity and reducing inputs, uh, expensive inputs during kind of the farm crisis years. And a lot of that is still true today, but today we're also made up of farmers from all other enterprises and from all, all shapes and all sizes. And our membership is also made up of uh, friends of farmers who support our mission as well. And the mission is um, to strengthen farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And this mission allows us to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and communities. Our values at Practical Farmers are welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration, and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. Like I said, we are a member-based organization, so if you are um, wanting to connect more with Practical Farmers of Iowa, I want to encourage you to join us. Uh, we have various rates of uh, membership, and as a member, you can tap into our network. Really what makes membership beneficial is all of our members. We have um, a network of farmers and friends of farmers who are willing and eager to help each other out. And so we have um, discussion lists where you can you know, post production or business issues. Um, and get feedback from other members. We have newsletters that we send out quarterly, um, get discounts to our events, opportunity to participate in on-farm research trials that we conduct with our members, and a lot of other programming. Also, if you haven't noticed today in your email inbox or on social media, today is Giving Tuesday, which is kind of a reminder to support those organizations that work on issues that you care about. So at Practical Farmers of Iowa, we are a nonprofit. If you'd like to join PFI, that's a, that's a great way to support us. Um, uh, we greatly appreciate all the support we get from our members and our donors. So thank you for that. Um, we do have an event calendar on our website. Just wanted to point that out. It is kind of the off season for a lot of things. But um, check the event calendar. There's still tons of stuff on there aside from our farminars. And speaking of events, we do have in January, the biggest event of the year for practical farmers, January 20th and 21st, is our annual conference in Ames, Iowa. And we just released our booklet, which lists all the sessions we've got planned. There are over 50 sessions this year, um, workshops and um, uh, community discussion groups, all kinds of um, things going on at the uh, IS, on the ISU campus, January 20th and 21st. Uh, for farmers of all skill levels, of all enterprises. So check out our website for all those details. It's going to be a really great weekend. So 
real quick then, some, some kind of rules here. Um, like I said, if you want to stay in touch with PFI's Farminars, go ahead and throw your email address uh, in, that, in that chat box. I'll put you on our list and we'll notify you when Farminars are coming up. Um, also, it's fun to see where people are tuning in from, so it looks like you're all getting the idea and kind of posting where you're, where you're from. Looks like a nice mix across Iowa. Um, also, we have uh, a little poll on the bottom left corner of the screen, if you haven't noticed that. It just gives us an idea of a head count of how many people tune in. So if, they're, if it's just you tuning in, if you don't mind checking that number one box, sometimes there are two or three people that that uh, tune in together from one computer. Just um, check the appropriate box in that in that poll so we get an idea how many people are watching these things. Um, I hope to save plenty of time tonight for questions, so I'm going to have uh, Matt speak first, then Christine, and then hopefully around 8 o'clock or so, maybe just a little bit after, we're going to switch over to questions and answers. So be thinking of questions for these two speakers. Um, you can type them in at any time, but um, if we don't get to it, then we will at the end of the presentation. So don't worry about that. Sometime after 8 o'clock, we'll get to those. And then one final thing is that um, near the end of the presentations, I'm going to put a link on the Farminar here for a survey. And we really appreciate any feedback about this Farminar um, and about what kind of topics you want to see in future Farminars. So if you could just take a quick minute at the end of this presentation, to give us some feedback in that survey. I'll be posting that link later in the evening. Again, thanks for tuning in, and now I'm going to pull up Matt Russell's presentation and let Matt take it away. All right, so should I just get started? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear whenever you're ready then. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, for inviting me to uh, to participate in this. Um, it's a it's a strange uh, way of presenting when I'm staring at a screen and talking, but I see there's almost uh, there's over 20 of us here. So, um, uh, I'm mostly going to speak out of my experiences farming, um, but a lot of what I know and what I do, I, I'm fortunate that the job I do at Drake informs how I farm and how I farm informs what I do at Drake. So most American farms have off-farm income and in our household I have the off-farm income and my husband Pat works full-time on the farm. Um, not everyone is has the luxury of having an off-farm job that actually complements the on-farm enterprises. So I, I'm very blessed and fortunate that that's where I come from. Um, the Ag Law Center, we, we primarily our law school and we train attorneys and uh, but we also have kind of like an extension service uh, Neil Hamilton's the director he's been running the Agricultural Law Center for uh, I think this is his 34th year um, and so he identifies um, research topics uh, I've been here I'm in my 11th year so we research different different areas um, done a lot of work in in retail agriculture and direct farm marketing and doing a lot of work now in, in um, resiliency and conservation. Um, um, and I haven't done a lot of work in taxes, um, and we don't have a tax clinic or anything like that. But I can say as a farmer that the tax code is one of the most important things that we think about in our operation. And not that we understand the tax code very well, but we understand how important it is. So we use um, an attorney to do our taxes, and that's part of my pitch is that um, you're, uh, any farmer is going to reach a size where um, they're probably going to want to find um, uh, uh, someone that they're hiring to help them navigate, whether it's an accountant or an attorney, to navigate that tax code. Because Congress, uh, the presidents, and the courts have all uh, consistently made the commitment that they believe that uh, when farmers invest in their farms, it's good for the whole country. And so the tax code for farmers is different than about any other business. Um, and, and Christine can talk more about those specifics, but I, I can say that the, the incentive in the tax code is for farmers to invest in their farms and build wealth. And so I'm going to talk a lot about that tonight in terms of our strategy on our farm. Um, we're in Marion County, um, about 40 miles southeast of Des Moines. And we bought the farm in 2005. 
uh, it's 110 acres. Uh, conventional wisdom said it should have just been, you know, kind of buildings pushed in and combined with another farm, but we're using retail agriculture to try to increase, uh, maximize our, our revenue on small acreage uh, to make it a viable farm. Um, and you can see there what we do is uh, fruits and vegetables and uh, eggs on pasture and grass finished beef. Um, right now we have 11 cows. Um, we have about 150 laying hens, and we kind of are around a third of an acre of produce with a 30 by 72 foot high tunnel. And we do raise mules, although that's not been a high revenue generator for us. <clears throat> we market um, pretty much all retail agriculture direct marketing. Um, we've been at the downtown farmers market. This was our, our 11th year. Um, we also do a delivery into Plymouth Church. So every Sunday night, we send out an email and people order from our list and we deliver to Plymouth Church on Wednesday nights. We do that all year round. Um, we do a little bit of off uh, on our farm, not really a f an official farm stand. But we do have a few customers that come and pick up. Most of our customers are Polk County, the Des Moines area. Um, and we have on an annual basis, partnering with seven other farms, we do farm crawl the first Sunday in October and that tends to be a pretty big day at our farm with uh, over a thousand people um, visiting and, and purchasing things uh, that day on our farm. We do a little bit of restaurant um, and I'll talk a little bit about this. We, we don't do a lot but um, Pat grew up with a couple of guys, uh, brothers that have restaurants in Des Moines and so we have pr primarily um, sold to them uh, mostly just tomatoes but we sell a few potatoes and once in a while some beef to a restaurant or two. But both the Plymouth Church and the coming into the restaurants, we combine that with my trip to Drake. Um, so coming to work. Uh, so we are combining that, that trip, uh, you know, doing other things with that trip and not just making it a single uh, trip into Des Moines for sales as much as we can. Um, so this is a few pictures of our farm. Um, that's me and Pat there with the uh, with the mules, and me and Pat with his sisters at Farm Crawl one year. And this is our farm, uh, 1930s house, barn. Uh, we've rehabilitated both of them. Uh, the greenhouse, uh, I think, is way to. I guess I'm not finding the button to push, but, but. Uh, in the middle to the right is um, the garage that we, um, oh, there's my arrow right here. So my tax guy said stop calling it a garage. So we call it now the processing building because we built, this is where the cars used to drive in, we built a wall here, we built a greenhouse on the south side, um, and then we have our freezers, we start all of our, all of our plants inside. Um, so that that building has been completely transitioned into um, uh, solely a farm building um, for processing, for um, storage of meat, um, uh, and uh, not not really processing. Um, we don't really process. It's for planting the starts for our plants, um, for storage, um, uh, particularly for meat. Um, and this is Pat in the high tunnel. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we jacked up the house and put a full basement under it. Um, so we've really rehabilitated the house and modernizing it. Um, the same way with the barn, um, redesigning it a little bit to for, for more of what we're using it for. Um, and here's, here's our yearly uh, farm income. Uh, I generally throw the numbers out there. I, I think it's important for people to see real numbers. Um, 2016 is still a bit of an estimate, um, and as you can see, we've we've we started very low in 2005 when both Pat and I we bought the farm. We were both working full time off the farm, but establishing a working farm in that first year, we rented out uh, 46 acres of the 110 acres to a neighbor who who grew commodity corn corn soybeans, and every year we took more of that into our own management. So after five years. In 2010, we were the whole farm was under our management. Um, a lot of the numbers here are our federal farm programs, which I'm going to show that slide in just a minute. 
um, to talk about how we've used federal programs, particularly in conservation, to help us increase the productivity of our farm. Um, and you can see we, we've went up and now we're, we're starting to go in a different direction and that's probably going to continue um, because I'm 46 and Pat's 53 and we're older and, and tireder and um, uh, can't work as hard as we did 10 years ago. So here's, um, here's our federal payments um, and on the left are the uh, the programs, so direct and counter-cyclical payments, uh, that's the first one. EQIP is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And I've broken that out a little bit into um, the High Tunnel Program, uh, the Managed Grazing Program, that was ponds and fencing and water systems. And then there was a final incentive payment at the end when we put everything into place. Um, and then CRP, uh, the rental payment as well as the cost share, uh, CSP is Conservation Stewardship Program, and the FMNP is the Farmers Market Nutrition Program, and those are the senior and uh, WIC coupons that we take at the farmers market, and that's kind of an estimate. Um, so, and then that's through 2011, and it's too much to put on one slide, so here's 2012 through 2016. As you can see, DCP went away in the 2014 Farm Bill, and now it's it's ARC um, and PLC. Um, EQIP, we don't have any more payments on. And uh, and then LFP is the Livestock Forage Program. And those payments came in 2014, but they were actually for 12 and 13 for the droughts. Um, and so that kind of gives you, and over to the far right is the totals. So coming all the way across, in the, uh, this is our 12th year on the farm, um, we've received $75,420. So that's our revenue is all sales and then these government payments. And over time, there's once in a while a little bit of, of custom uh, where we might have done some custom square bailing for a neighbor or something like that, but that's a very small part of our revenue. The, the main revenue is sales, and the second uh, level of revenue would be these government payments. Um, I'm going to go back to the, just to the yearly gross income. Something that I kind of knew going into when we bought the farm, I grew up on a commodity farm in western Iowa, and my parents and brother and sister-in-law are still farming, but it was corn and soybeans and beef cattle. And I knew from the little bit that I'd peeked in on my, my parents' financial situation is, is that I knew that it was normal for American agriculture for farms not to generate a lot of net income. And uh, so in all of these years, we have not generated any net income. Um, part of that is just the nature of the expenses and the costs, but part of it is also strategic in that we have poured everything that we've gen that we've that we've um, generated from the farm back into the farm. So we've used the the revenue from sales and from government programs to inc to increase the productivity of our farm, to um, increase the personal value as well as the pr productive value of our farm. We've built two ponds. We've put in um, a pump in a in an existing well. We've run thousands of feet of water line, um, and and thousands and thousands of feet of fencing um, to make the farm work for us. So taking a farm that was pretty much a commodity farm, but but on some pretty rough ground and changing that into strictly a grazing system and then a little bit of uh, uh, high value produce right around the house um, in, in, the, in the existing kind of farmyard area. And so we knew we were not going to be generating a lot of net income. That was never our strategy. Um, and the tax code has helped us do that because we can file uh, on a cash basis on, on an annual basis. And, and really, the tax code incentivizes us to pour the money back into the farm. So here is, here is um, I'll go back to that. This is what we've leveraged from the farm. We've, we've built up a lot of credit 
and part of that is the run-up in the the price of farmland while since we bought the farm but we use credit to improve the farm we've used credit to improve the farmhouse and the and the buildings and we've built a pretty significant amount of household and family wealth um, I, I think my estimate is is that we've built about um, close to three hundred thousand dollars in in wealth and that's pretty conservative we could probably convince somebody that we've built more than that but um, we try to take a fairly conservative view of our finances so that we're managing our risk by not overextending ourselves um, so we we figure we've generated uh, somewhere between twenty and twenty five thousand dollars a year um, in wealth and that's been really our strategy what we haven't bought with farm income is a sack of groceries, uh, health insurance, household utilities, a gallon of gas, clothes, soap, shampoo, vacuum cleaner, um, a vacation, principal payments on the farm. In other words, we haven't generated any net income, and all of these expenses have to come from income from someplace else. Um, in some cases, in some years, we've actually been able to offset our off-farm income um, because of some of the losses or the expenses of, uh, of our on-farm. And so using a tax attorney, uh, using an attorney to do our taxes to help us navigate that so that we're uh, taking full advantage of the law as it exists, but making sure that we're not um, stepping over any lines or abusing the law or getting ourselves at risk. Almost on an annual basis, I ask our attorney, once again, we're not generating any income. Are we at risk of getting um, uh, being audited? And they continually talk to me about, probably not, but if what you're telling us is true, we don't think you have any, you know, if that happens, we think we can navigate that pretty, pretty successfully. You're clearly a working farm, you're putting the, you're, you've got a, a uh, you've got records of putting your of investing in the farm um, you're certainly not trying trying to lose money what you're doing is investing in the farm so having a, a partner in a professional to help us understand that um, has been really really helpful um, these are some of the things that we bought with our farm income so it's not like we're hiding the money <laughs> we're hiring the neighbor kids to help us we have made huge improvements, tens of thousands of dollars spending on, on um, things for our farm that generates a tremendous amount of rural development dollars in our neighborhood, the labor um, farm kids, you know, the neighbor kids, um, the ponds and such. Um, our inputs, we're spending um, well over $10,000 a year every year, some years higher than that, um, just on inputs of seed and feed um, and other supplies, and then when you add in um, equipment, um, you, you know we've we've spent a lot of money um, building up our pr productive assets as well as our wealth assets on the farm. We've expanded our livestock. When we bought the farm, we owned two cows. We now own eleven. Um, we we buy chickens every uh, every eighteen uh, about every year or eighteen months. Um, uh, we're using, um, you know, our we we use our attorney to help us understand how to break out our taxes in terms of being able to put a percentage on our electric and our water. Um, we wash all of our eggs in the house. Um, in the winter time, we use the hot water in the house to take out to the chickens because we don't have electric. We move the building around, and then there's no electric in our chicken building. Um, so we, we think about how we're using things in the house for farm use and then come up with a way of accounting for that. When we, when we lifted the house, one third of the basement that we put in was a root cellar. Yeah, uh, it looks like Matt Lansing was right, and we were losing Matt for a second, and uh, now he's gone. 
So hopefully Matt logs back in in a second and I'll bump him right up into this. Um, am I am I back now? There he is. Yeah, okay. you're back. All right. All, All right. right. So, sorry about that. Um, no. And I'll try to work through this. Just I hate just droning on here. Um, interest. So anyway, we built the the basement, and so working with our attorney to understand how we could depreciate some of that. I mean, some of it's just living living space. Some of it is actually farm space, and understanding those differences and helping someone put it, put that on a depreciation schedule is really helpful for us because I don't understand the tax code enough to do that myself. But there are huge advantages for us to be able to use the tax code to help us build the farm we want um, in, in, in ways that are um, helpful and legal. And then interest payments on the farm as well, on our farm loans. So understanding how credit and expenses and interest, um, you know, understanding that there's a way to navigate that for an advantage. Um, and then what we've learned is, is that we're very much about wealth creation rather than income generating. And, and that is the story of American agriculture. When you look at the statistics and the numbers, um, you'll see a lot, like the average household income of a farm in the Midwest is like around $80,000, of which about $1,500 of that is net income from the farm. So when people say, a lot of times people will talk to us about our farm and say, well, are you ever, do you ever want to go full time? Or you know, they're shocked when they find out that we haven't actually generated any net income. Um, and that's usually an indicator to me that people don't understand the tax code or they don't understand what a real farm looks like in the United States because real farms are using the tax code um, in ways to build their farm and to generate wealth and, and to do a lot of rural economic development. Um, so it, it, Schedule F, the tax code is, is front and center to us in our strategies for our farm Relationships are fundamental. Our relationship with our tax attorney, with our customers, with our neighbors, with our with the contractors that have done a lot of the work on our farm. It's just those relationships are so important. Um, we're getting old. We can't do this forever. So we also have an exit strategy or a, a slowdown strategy. Um, it, we don't have to just get bigger and grow all the time. We, we have another strategy of, of going the other direction and enjoying a higher quality of life um, in, in while we're actually changing our production and, and lowering some of our output. Um, USDA has been great. Um, the American taxpayer has made a huge investment in our farm and we owe the taxpayer uh, a huge commitment to keep putting those conservation practices in play that, that they've paid us to do. Um, and off-farm income is so important. We, we couldn't be doing this without it. Um, and and Credit is very important. Also, financial constraints. If we, when we started, if we'd had no financial constraints, we would have made a lot more mistakes than we did. Those financial constraints helped us be more strategic and make fewer mistakes. Um, there's some other considerations just to think about. Is I haven't talked a lot about labor, but but there's some issues that you want to work through your um, with your consultant, whether it's an accountant or whether it's your attorney, thinking about labor on your farm. Um, workman's compensation. We do carry workman's compensation. It is a great protection for us, and and the five five or six hundred dollars we spend a year on workman's comp is 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 money well worth spent in terms of uh, the risk it uh, the risk coverage it provides us. Healthcare is another really important thing. Uh, figuring out how um, if if you do have one person staying at home farming full time, what is it? What is the tax implications of that? Are there some advantages? How do you get health care? Um, really important stuff. Um, sometimes people misunderstand there's different jurisdictions. So your county and your property tax is different than the Schedule F. Um, and that's different than what USDA thinks of as a farmer. So there's kind of lots of different entities uh, or lots of different um, jurisdictions that are that are defining farming in a little bit different ways and just because one entity defines you as a farm doesn't mean that the another um, a, another uh, uh, jurisdiction is going to define it the same way so understanding those is really important and so I, with that I'll, I'll yield the time over to um, Christine and wait for questions great thank you Matt
Um, while I'm pulling up Christine's um, presentation, though, it looks like Matt Lansing had a question that was relevant for you right now. He said, uh, what if you're just on farms that are rented? And this is when you're talking about, um, you know, uh, building wealth on your farm. And so if you're in a situation where you're renting and so it would invest in equip equipment, how would that differ from investing in farm improvements like ponds and watering systems and stuff like that? Do you know? Yeah. So am I still on? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you can, you can hear me, right? Yep. Can you jump in? Okay. Uh, so one of the things is, and I talk to people about this a lot, where they're they're just starting farming. Um, you may not be able to build a lot of wealth initially, but you do have a lot of expenses when you're just renting. And so understanding um, what what are um, what are acceptable or recognized expenses. So um, understanding your traveling to and from different places. So there's mileage, um, there's there's tools and equipment, there's clothing, there's all kinds of things that even if you're just renting, you want to make sure that you're accounting for all those things and counting them as an expense. Um, so that's that's one piece of advice. Um, you know, another another is um, you know if you're just renting, you you can build some wealth through livestock. That's a little more challenging. Um, uh, but but part of it is is if you want to run as much of the income through Schedule F as you can, and you want to run as many you know as much expense through Schedule F as you can, um, so that that's kind of how it's set up. It's in, it's to incentivize farmers to um, uh, to 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 put as much expense through there as they can because it's incentivizing farmers to spend money. So if you're spending that money anyway, make sure you're figuring out how to run that through the tax through, through your um, Schedule F and your taxes, so that you get tax you know you get credit for it in terms of offsetting your income. Great, and and Matt, just another real quick is that Kathy Dice has a question there, and I know Christine's going to talk about the Schedule F, but do you know specifically her question where you claim farm improvements like ponds and creek crossings on the Schedule F? Yeah, that's a that in, in our experience, that's going to be a depreciated a depreciated expense. So while you, you there, you know, you can file your taxes on a cash basis. In other words, you know, you don't have to. Um, uh, I'm blanking on the term. It's cash basis and a and a. Christine can probably talk about that. This, yeah, this is Christine. I'm, I am going to address that, um, Kathy, as far as conservation expenses. And um, yeah, if you qualify for the deduction, it goes on line 12, but um, there are limitations to what can be deducted and what has to be capitalized. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into um, the presentation. And I'd be glad to take additional questions on that, um, you know, as we get into that more in more detail. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. And you can go right ahead into your presentation then, and then we'll, okay. we'll do some awesome. questions. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm really glad to be here, too. It, um, it's it's pretty great that we have two centers of agricultural law um, so close together. And I the work that they do at Drake Law School is, is awesome. And the work that we do at Iowa State I think complements that because we we sort of have different realms that we focus on. Um, so in my role at the Center of Agricultural Law and Taxation at Iowa State, I do um, analyze you know current agricultural law issues outside of tax. Um, but one of our key focuses at the center is to train. Um, uh, tax preparers, accountants, attorneys, and things in the tax laws and new tax laws in particular. So, um, for example, for the month of November, um, we've been traveling throughout Iowa um, conducting two-day tax schools um, for mainly tax preparers, and some producers like to come as well um, to sort of keep everyone up to speed on what the what the newest tax provisions are and things like that and so I'm here to tell you with uh, 10 million words is what I recently read 10 million words in the tax code and the tax regulations um, I'm here to tell you uh, there are there is lots of that that I don't understand um, 
I think no tax preparer understands all of the tax code. It's so complicated. So as producers, don't feel um, bad <laughs> when you feel like something is complicated or you don't understand it because um, they've just made the tax code way too complex. Um, but it is important, I think, for everybody who runs a business, farmers in particular, um, to sort of understand key provisions of the tax code to understand how tax returns are filed so that, as Matt said, you make good business decisions because you have to understand um, what expenses you can deduct and those types of things so that you can understand what a wise thing to do in terms of purchase, lease, sell, you know, you have to understand the tax implications of those things. So in the short time I have with you today, obviously we can't go through too much detail, but what I can do is to advise you, as Matt did, to if you don't already, to make sure that you have good counsel um, on your side because you know farming is risky. There, there's just a lot to it um, that you have to understand uh, for the farming, and then you add to it the whole tax complexity. Um, you really need to educate yourself, but also seek counsel. I think everybody needs um, a good tax advisor if you're in the business of farming. And as Matt said, it's really typical that um, the average farm will generate tax losses. So the the great thing is if you are a for-profit farm as opposed to a hobby farm, and we'll talk just briefly about that um, because it's really important that you are actually after a profit because otherwise the IRS will classify you as a hobby farm and say, oops, you can't deduct those, you know, those expenses because you're not really in this for profit. Um, you can um, offset, as Matt said, the losses that you have in your farming business against off-farm income, which can come in really handy during downturns. So let's say one spouse is a teacher and has wages, um, then that income can actually be offset by losses on the farm, which, which again can be very helpful um, when you're starting off your business um, and also when you're in the middle of the business as well. And so one thing I think that any tax advisor would tell you when you come into their office to sort of get started working with them um, to prepare tax returns is that you really need to keep good records. And, you know, this goes beyond just tax preparation. If you're a good business person, you're going to have good bookkeeping. And so if you haven't already invested in good software, I, I would advise you know, advise you to do that, make sure that you have QuickBooks or something that works well for you where you can record all of the information related to your farm business um, because you're going to need it. You're going to need all the detailed information about your expenses. You're going to need the detailed information about your purchases. Um, and, and so IRS on audit is going to require that you substantiate um, a number of the expenses that you take. So, you know, it's not like you have to turn these in with your Schedule F or your Form 1040, but if you get audited and they come to you, you have to have um, proof that the expenses that you took um, actually happened and that they were valid expenses, um, particularly with things such as if you're claiming business mileage for your, uh, you know, farming business, um, you need to have a travel log. You, you need to keep track of these things. Um, you can't just slap numbers on a form and expect that the IRS is, is just going to let you um, claim those numbers if, if indeed you are audited down the, down the road. So any good tax advisor is going to, you know, talk to you thoroughly about the types of records that you need to keep. Um, if you're purchasing assets, if you're purchasing equipment like a, a tractor, or you're purchasing um, land, anything like that, asset records, you need to keep detailed records about that as well. Because one of the things we'll talk about is um, in terms of farmland, a lot of the expenses that you incur to develop that land, depending on your situation, some of those might not be able to be deducted, but they'll be capitalized. So the cost of those improvements will be added to the basis of your property. So for example, if you purchase your land at $1,000 an acre and, and, and you uh, pour in improvements that are equivalent to $200 an acre, 
your new basis in the property is $1,200. So if you turn around and sell it later, you'll pay less um, capital gains tax on on the um, the increase in in uh, value of your farm, um, but you don't necessarily get to deduct everything right away. And other expenses, as you know, you have to take over time. You don't get to deduct them necessarily in the year that you make the purchase, but instead, typically, you get to depreciate them over time. So we'll talk about it, but these records are really important um, because you have to be able to substantiate the, the, the deductions that you are allowed to take on your tax return. Typically, um, what the IRS will say is um, because the statute of limitations for auditing a tax return is three years, and it's three years from the date the return is either filed or due, or it's two years from the date that you actually paid the tax that was owed, so whichever is longer. So beyond that, the IRS really can't go after you um, on an audit unless either you didn't file at all, then there's no statute. I mean, if you don't file, they can come after you 20 years later and, and still try to try to um, get get your money. Um, or if if you committed some type of fraud. Um, but, but in a typical situation, you know, you really have to worry about keeping records for uh, substantiating things that you claim on a return, so things that would be needed on an audit um, for about three years from the time that you file. So that's sort of a helpful guideline. Now I wouldn't suggest rushing right out there and throwing your records away after three years, um, but talk to your tax advisor and see what um, his or her preference is and, and make sure to go along with that. Because things like charitable contributions, um, as you know, those can be very valuable tax savings devices, but you have to have uh, detailed records of those and you actually have to have a statement from the charity if you get audited um, it's not sufficient to show a canceled check showing that you wrote a check to this particular charity you actually have to have a contemporaneous contemporaneous written acknowledgement from the charity that you gave your donation to stating that you got nothing of value in return. And a lot of people don't realize that you actually have to have that in your hands technically at the time you file your tax return. And so if you're later audited, you can't then go to the charity and say, oh, can you quick give me a receipt? Um, IRS might not look at that. So when it comes to asset records, so I'm talking about records of your machinery, your equipment, your your farmland, that, those types of things, you really need to keep those records long term because um, you're going to be depreciating that asset. So, so as long as you own the asset, you need to keep the detailed records about that asset because it's going to be really important for you to keep track of what the basis is in that asset, how much you paid for it, um, how much depreciation you took, whether you took any special expensing deductions, those types of things. Um, very important. And then if you happen to have employees, you really need to keep employment records for at least four years. So those are just some sort of rough guidelines, um, but record keeping is definitely important. Matt touched a little bit on accounting methods, and like I said, I could go on for any of these topics probably for an hour each um, at least, so my goal is to just sort of give you a high level um, uh, overview, you know, half an inch deep is all, um, but but most of most of you, most farmers are, are going to use the cash method of accounting because IRS allows it for farming and it's very easy. And so essentially, with the cash method as opposed to accrual, you get a you get to take your expenses when you incur them and you claim your income when you receive it. Now there is this this uh, little doctrine called constructive receipt and basically what that means is if you are entitled to receive payment for something in 2016 for example let's say the grain elevator calls you and says okay we have your check come, come and get it that is income that you received in 2016. You cannot at that time say to the grain elevator, oh, I'll pick it up in January and then claim it as income in January. Um, it is income to you when you are entitled to receive it when it is made available to you without restriction. On the other hand, if you actually um, have an agreement with the grain elevator where um, you sell your grain in 2015 under a contract, but the payment is not called 
before until 2017. So in my example, I used 2015, 2016. But let's say you sold your grain right now and you had a contract with the elevator that says that they would pay you January of 2017, then that would be gross income in 2017 as opposed to 2016. So, um, you know, that that is allowed. You just have to have um, an actual arm's length um, contract that that allows that to be so so just you know in the little bit of time we have um, Matt mentioned schedule F um, and and that is that's the key uh, document that you'll um, fill out for the IRS when you or your tax preparer um, hopefully um, prepares your tax return and schedule F isn't a you know, a standalone document, as as I'm sure you know, it's a supplement to Form 1040. So, this is if you are just a individual tax payer. Um, if you have an, an entity of some kind, if you have um, an S corporation or you are in a partnership, you'll file a different um, tax return. Um, but if you are a sole proprietor or you're a single member LLC. Um, that's disregarded, um, you will use 1040 and a Schedule F. And the Schedule F is where you report your farm income. And so this is where all of your, um, you know, income producing activities and expenses um, get listed for the most part. And so there's sort of two main parts if you're a cash um, farmer, um, you have the income section, which is lines 1 through 11. And so as, as I'm sure you realize when you're in farming and you're growing a commodity, let's say you're growing corn or something, and you sell that corn, that, that's going to be ordinary income. And so that's going to go on that top part of your Schedule F. Um, and as are government payments. So Matt was talking about um, the government payments that um, he had received um, to make his farm run. Um, those types of payments are just considered ordinary income. Um, it's farming income. It goes right on your Schedule F. Crop insurance payments that you receive, those are considered income to the farm. Um, you do have an ability with crop insurance payments to defer that income. Um, to the following tax year if you so choose um, but you know for the most part it's just ordinary income so that's sort of where your income is reported in that top section now one thing to note if you uh, sell livestock that's held for draft or breeding or dairy um, that's a little different that's a that's a little different uh, sort of thing because you did not raise that livestock to sell it um, you raised it for a particular purpose so that sales of those types of livestock are actually going to be reported on a different form, um, which is Form 4797. Um, but your livestock that you hold for sale um, is reported on Schedule F. So here's what the Schedule F, the Part 1, looks like. And, um, you know, pretty pretty straightforward. You can kind of see I've we filled out just a little bit to kind of give an example of, of what it might look like. Um, but but you've, I'm sure if you've been farming, um, you've seen this, and, and maybe some of you have filled this out yourself. Now, really, the heart of the Schedule F and the really important thing for farmers to understand are what expenses are you allowed to deduct against your income because bottom line nobody wants to pay taxes right if you can get your income down as low as possible um, that's that's very beneficial and the tax code really is there to sort of um, help you be able to do that now we mentioned that um, you got to be careful about the word hobby <laughs> and the reason is because you know a lifestyle farm reports, you know, should use Schedule F to report agricultural activities. So you can have a lifestyle farm, which is, you know, not your sole source of income. It's it's it supplements your income, maybe you have off farm income and all of that. But as long as you're engaged in the farm for the purpose of making a profit, it's Schedule F income. It's it's farming income. It's it's uh, it's income against which you can deduct losses. But as soon as you venture into just having a hobby farm, which is really defined as, 
you're not in it for a profit intent at all. Um, a lot of times the types of farms that um, are classified as hobby farms would be maybe you own horses. That seems to be um, a, a key fact pattern in a lot of cases that end up before the IRS. And they'll say, nope, you were just doing this as a hobby. You're not allowed to use the losses that you um, that you generate from your hobby to offset other income. So if, if you are engaged in what's not really a profit venture, but more of a hobby, um, what you can do, you can still de deduct those losses somewhat, um, but you have to deduct them on Schedule A of your Section 1040, and they're only, you can only deduct them greater than 2%. So it's a huge difference. You don't want to be in that situation. You can't use hobby losses um, to offset off-farm income. It's a totally different thing. And IRS will audit you if, you know, if it, if it appears that you're not in it for a profit. So, you know, they give you, they give you a chance to to get off the ground and as Matt said you know he's had this conversation it sounds like um, with his with his tax preparer and it sounds like their farm is is definitely very much of a profit venture but um, but it is something that you should discuss in detail with your tax preparer if, if you if you're concerned that perhaps your activities are, are you know classified more as hobby than um, a profit venture so here's what part two of the Schedule F looks like. And so this is where, you know, the main expenses that you might incur in operating your farm um, get reported. And so, you know, it looks pretty straightforward and you look at it and, and then you realize that, um, you know, again, there's just thousands and thousands of pages of regulations that govern a lot of these. And so you have to sort of be wary that it, it may look simpler than it is. And, and you have to be a little bit careful um, about how you report things so that you don't signal a red flag for IRS to jump all over you and, and try to assess penalties against you for underreporting. Um, one thing that's important to realize is that your net farm profit is is going to be subject to self-employment tax, um, which you will have to report on Schedule SC. It's just like if you operate another type of business and, and use a Schedule C, same thing. Um, it's a business, so you have to pay self-employment tax on it. Um, and so you have to file your, your Schedule SE if your incomes from your uh, self-employment is $400 or more. And so you pay that, it's 15.3% when you're self-employed, um, but it's only on the first $118,500 of your of your net income. And then after that, there's this uh, Medicare tax that you have to pay, which is 2.9% of the income in excess of $118,500. Um, but the self-employment liability is does have that, that, that limit of uh, net income up to $118,500. And so one thing you should know or that you probably do know if, if you are in farming is that um, you, you definitely, you have to be on guard that you, you're paying your estimated taxes. So, um, you know, if you're in business for yourself, um, you don't have an employer that's withholding your taxes. So you're required under regulations to pay quarterly estimated payments of the amount of income tax that you will owe as in addition to your self-employment taxes. But if you are a qualified farmer, you have a different set of rules under which you can work because farming income is so sporadic. Um, the IRS has given cash flow farmers, um, you know, the cash flow is unique, so they've given farmers special provisions. But in order to qualify for this, you have to have at least two thirds of your gross income from all sources um, be from farming. So a lot of a lot of times, um, somebody who files a Schedule F, somebody who's a farmer, is not going to qualify for this estimated tax um, rule. So you know, if that's the case, make sure to file your quarterly um, taxes so that you don't owe penalties when when you actually pay them. But if you do if you do uh, meet this rule, where at least two thirds of your gross income from all sources is from farming, then you don't have to pay any estimated taxes as long as you file your return and pay all of the taxes that are due by March first. Um, 
So it's not technically that your taxes are due March 1st, it's just that you won't be penalized for not paying estimated taxes if you file and pay by March 1st. So that's a rule for those of you whose um, farming is, is your main source of, of income. Let's look a little bit in the time that we have remaining. We don't have a lot of time. A couple of key things um, related to farm expenses because there's a couple of things you really need to understand. So in any business, you have the ability to deduct presently the ordinary and necessary costs of operating that farm. Um, but there are limits, so you can't just automatically deduct everything. Some expenses have to be capitalized, which means you have to take the cost, the expense, and add it to the basis um, of the property, which is usually the price that you paid for it. You have to add the cost of the, of the improvement or whatever it is that you did to the basis, and you can't deduct it from your um, income. Uh, but um, but you know that can get complicated you can deduct the actual cost of operating a car in your farm business or you can choose to deduct mileage the only thing i'll tell you about um about uh, truck and car expenses is you need to keep good records because um, if you get audited the irs will require that you have um, good records of uh, your expenses or they will not allow the deduction now the, the, the big thing I'm going to talk about briefly before, um, before we wrap it up and open it up for questions is that you really have to understand depreciation because as Matt said, you know, part of the incentive of the tax code is to um, pour your money back into um, capital assets and improvements and things to really develop your farm. And when you buy a, an asset that has a useful life, you don't typically get to deduct the cost of that asset immediately when you buy it. The, the, the default is not to be able to just deduct it. So let's say I bought a tractor. Um, a tractor is farm equipment which would have a, a useful life of, of seven years under, under standard accounting principles if, if I'm just using general depreciation. So typically what I would do, I'd buy the tractor and I'd take the cost of that and I'd have to, let's just use a simple, there are different ways to do it, but if I was using say a straight line just simply, over the course of seven years I would deduct the cost of that tractor. Okay, so that's historically and typically how farmers would handle expenses. Now, Congress in its desire to sort of um, generate uh, um, spending, to stimulate the economy, um, to try to encourage businesses to reinvest in their businesses and, and keep the economy going, have created a couple of really important provisions that impact farming and farmers greatly. And so the one that, that I, I'm just going to talk about these two provisions before we wrap up. Um, the one that you hear about the most is Section 179. And that's just the, the number of the tax code provision um, where, this, where this deduction um, originates. Um, but everybody calls it Section 179. So it's not really a technical term. It's just, it's just what they call it. But basically what Section 179 does is it says, OK, if you're a small business person, if you're a farmer, and you invest or buy an asset, you get to deduct that expense in the year you place that asset into service. So let's go back to this tractor. Let's say it's a $100,000 tractor that I purchase. Instead of having to spread out the deduction of that expense over a seven year period, with, one sec with 179, I get to take an expense deduction in the year I put that tractor into service, the whole $100,000 I get to offset against my income. And at the end of 2015, Congress made this Section 179 permanent with a limit of $500,000. So for 2016, I can, I can deduct $500,000 in qualifying expenses in the year I purchase the um, assets. Now, there is a cap of 
what's called a threshold, which sort of keeps this deduction uh, to be one that's be able to really be used by smaller businesses and farmers as opposed to you know huge businesses and that threshold says if I spend more than two million ten thousand dollars per year on asset purchases qualifying purchases then I then my deduction phases out dollar for dollar for every dollar I spend above that amount. So for every dollar I spend, so so in this case for 2016, if I spend two million five hundred ten thousand dollars in assets, I don't have a section 179 deduction. But if I spend less than that, I have one. And for most farmers, you know, you're going to have the five hundred thousand dollars available to you. Um, and that number is going to be indexed for inflation starting next year. So for 2017, you can actually presently deduct $510,000 in the year that you make the purchase. Now, again, we're running out of time, but one thing I do want to say is, you know, so here's a list of the things that qualify um, machinery or equipment, new or used for Section 179, which is good. Um, you cannot use Section 179 for machine sheds or general purpose agricultural buildings. However, if you are putting up what qualifies as a single purpose agricultural building, like a special um, building designed for hogs or something like that, um, that is considered 15 year property and that is something that you can use section 179 for um, you can use it for drainage tile fences really for most of the things that you purchase for your farm um, you can use section 179 um, to expense that but what i was going to say is you do have to realize that if you would turn around and sell that piece of equipment um, you are now going to have if you if you expense that entire purchase so let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar tractor and i expense the entire amount so i drive my basis down to zero if i turned around and sold it the next year for eighty thousand dollars i'm going to have to have what's called recapture i'm going to have to recapture um that ordinary income that i earned from because I've already depreciated it so that eighty thousand dollars that I get from the sale is going to be ordinary income that I have um, that is going to be subject to ordinary income tax so that's something to just keep in mind especially in a downturned economy that um, section 179 is great um, for you know purchasing equipment for investing but you know it, it it can't be so great on the back end sometimes if you're scaling back it can it can actually come back to bite you so um, that's section 179 um, there's a companion um, uh, code called bonus depreciation that you've probably heard about as well I call it companion because the two kind of go hand in hand but they are very different um, Congress made the section 179 deduction permanent Congress looked at bonus depreciation and said, you know what, we're going to extend it for five years. This was in 2015. So it, it, it has been extended through 2019. Um, it is being phased out over the course of those five years, however. But for the next couple of years, it's at 50%, which what it means is that you can deduct 50% of the basis of your property in the year you place that property into service. Um, and there's no upper limit on this one. But it is available only for new property. And the the other thing that's distinctive about bonus depreciation as opposed to Section 179 is you can use bonus depreciation for that machine shed, for that building that's not single purpose. It does apply um, to farm buildings. So that's a pretty cool thing um, that people have used bonus depreciation a lot. Now, there are a lot of situations where something you buy is going to qualify for both 179 and bonus and so the ordering rules on that are that you apply the the five hundred thousand dollars or whatever portion of your 179 deduction you're going to use um, you apply that first 
and that reduces your basis by the amount that you expense and then you get to take the next 50 percent um, as bonus depreciation and then if there's any amount left where your basis is above zero then you would use regular depreciation and I've put that acronym in there makers that's just standard depreciation to depreciate the rest of the useful life of the asset out over time um, so that that's just sort of a couple of key um, provisions that you really need to be aware of if, if you are in farming um, they are uh, expenses that you deduct right on part two of schedule F and I'm totally out of time um, so I would like to entertain any questions if you have some or um, you know just yeah. open it up I guess for hearing what you what you'd like to talk about great thank you so much Christine that was um, a ton of really good juicy information that I think we're all still trying to wrap our heads around I'll um, there were a few questions in the chat box there and um, Katie had one first which um, really goes back to the first thing that that Matt said was that um, he hires a tax attorney to help him with this and then he, after, yes. after hearing everything <laughs> after hearing everything that you just went through I can see why and so Katie's question was about how um, or do you have any advice on on how to find um, a good tax specialist that can help you with this specific maybe to your enterprise of farming and maybe Matt can answer this too but did you have any advice for trying to find someone who can really navigate this for you yeah that's a great question and I'll let Matt answer too but um, I really think word of mouth is is one of the best ways to do it um, you know talk to other people that you trust that that are in farming find out who they use you know go to people you trust and ask them and that's really usually one of the best ways if it's an attorney you can vet them you can go online and and you know you can look at their history and make sure that they're qualified make sure they don't have disciplinary actions against them that concern you you know you can look at their rating on lawyers.com and see how their peers have rated them things like that um, with accountants you you know you can just I think definitely look at the reputation of the firm um, and and just talk to other people who've used them Matt do you have anything to add to that are you on so, mute Matt? I, I maybe just, I just, yeah I just undid it um, I would say um, there's there's really two groups of people there's accountants and there's attorneys um, they're, they're mostly going to be your, your service providers f for, for taxes. Um, and uh, as Christine said, word of mouth. But something to think about is, is that there are those professionals all over the state who are serving farmers. Um, if, you're, if you're doing traditional commodities, those, those, it's pretty easy to, to find um, your county seat attorneys are based a lot of them their practices are built around um, tax uh, preparation uh, one thing that you want to ask though is is if your operation is not traditional just commodity corn and soybeans or traditional livestock um, you want to talk to them about that initially so that they understand your operation and they understand whether they want to they won't, if they have expertise that they if there's something they don't know that they want to learn it that kind of thing so if you're doing something you know that's alternative and not just kind of corn and soybeans or livestock you do want to bring that up right away so you're not wasting anybody's time if, if they're not prepared to help you with with something a little bit different awesome um, I did just pull up the um, this sh the slide that shows our website because we do have a lot of um, resources on the website at the Center for Ag Law and Taxation I write a lot of articles we put out a lot of resources if you really into tax and, and maybe you're one of those people that does do your own tax returns we also have a, um, a companion site called tax place it has a subscription of $150 a year um, but we put out more technical details there and include a lot of webinars we have a lot of one-hour webinars that we do and you can replay all of those we also um, have farm tax seminars that we put on and we put the replays for all those seminars and things out there as well so there are resources on an ongoing basis 
Um, there's a couple of uh, questions. It looks like um, a couple people are asking about what I guess I'll call the tangible property regulations. You might have heard them called the repair regulations. Um, talk about um, complicated and um, a couple of years ago IRS put out new regulations that you probably heard about that um, govern um, and try to I guess elaborate a little bit more on how you know whether something is a repair or an improvement, um, whether you have to capitalize the cost of something or whether you can deduct it um, as, as a repair. And, and one of the things that they put into place when they, when they implemented these regulations, at first it was a $500 de minimis safe harbor, um, but then immediately they put it in there up, they upped it to $2,500. So for 2016, there is this um, de minimis safe harbor that farmers or other business people can use um, where if you have an accounting policy in place that says that you're going to expense any item, um, let's say $2,500 or less, um, that's how you treat it. So if you treat it that way for your accounting policy, um, you can actually deduct it um, on your income tax uh, return as well as an expense. Now, one thing that you have to remember, and, and it doesn't come up a lot, um, but if, if, for example, you have something that is an asset that could actually appreciate in value, um, if you have expensed it under this de minimis policy, when you turn around, if you happen to turn around and resell it, so let's talk about this breeding cow that we've purchased. And the breeding cow when I bought it was $600 and it fell under my expense limit. So I expensed it immediately. But then I decide that I have too many breeding cows and I sell one and I sell it for $1,500 then suddenly um, my entire amount, because my basis is now zero, my entire amount of that sale price is going to be considered ordinary income to me. Now one thing about it, it won't be subject to self-employment tax, but, but you do need to talk with your tax um, professional before you just implement an accounting policy um, and really think through what you want that to look like and whether you want to use the de minimis safe harbor but that's a really excellent question because that is a um that is a that that is a a great change um that that has come about and, and it makes things um, a little bit simpler because people can't expense things without having to worry too much about whether you capitalize it or expense it um i'm trying to look if there's other um yeah christine other questions. was that did, did that just address um, Bill's question about selling breeding stock and, and he asked what the what was the schedule that you oh, said the cash flow had to be reported? Yeah, good qu good question. Yep, I didn't see Bill's. Um, yeah, Bill, that is form 4797. Um, it's the it's it's uh, it's the form that that you use that's different from just uh, selling your regular beef cattle. Um, and reporting that on Schedule F. It's the same form that you use if you sell an asset like the tractor. Um, that's where you report that as well. Um, so it, that's an important farm, form for farmers to, to know about, Form 4797. Great. And, and then there was, a, there was a question just before Bill. Anita had asked, um, how do you report income from leasing animals? Do you, do you, are you familiar with that at all? Or maybe Matt would be too. I'm not sure if he has experience with leasing his livestock. So if if you were to lease your um, and, bre breeding heifer to someone, yeah, that gets a little more um, a little more complicated. Um, but typically, I believe it would just be also considered. Uh, farming income as opposed to Schedule E rental income. I, I, I believe it would be, but that's one I'd have to I'd have to dig into a little more deeply because that's not as common of a situation. That's a good question, Anita. Great. Um, I think going down the list, then we've covered a lot of these. Karen, Karen had the question: Can you speak to the capitalization policy? 
I don't know. If yep, and I think that's, I think she was talking about the tangible okay. property regulations yep. that I talked about. Yep, yep, good question. Great. Um, Ford's question then, what regulations are there for paying seasonal neighbors that work on your farm? And, and I know Matt definitely has experience with that. Yeah, Matt, if you want to talk about that, that's great. Otherwise, I can jump in. Well, I'll just, we've made a decision on our farm. Um, we, we've, all of our labor has always been casual labor. Um, and so I, there's, I think, two things that, that Bill might be pointing out um, or whoever asked the question. One is when you hire, when you hire help, um, we do it all as, on a casual basis, and so it's all um, 1099s um, because we're not setting their schedule. Um, they're typically bringing their own equipment, you know, their gloves, and we're not providing them with that. Um, and and the main thing is is that we're not we're not we're, we're mostly doing like if it's bailing hay, it's bailing hay. We pay them by the hour, but it's but it's like task oriented. Um, and, and we're not scheduling them and we're not supervising them as employees. And we typically are doing that all just ad hoc. So that's worked well for us. And our, our outlays are usually somewhere between $3,000 and I think eight or $9,000 total labor costs aside from the labor that Pat and I are providing. That's kind of the range. Um, the other thing is, is it, you can trade labor, um, and I don't. We don't typically record that, but there, I think technically there might be a way to do that. And Christine, you might, you know, address that if if I'm helping my neighbor do chores and then they're turning around and helping me make hay. Um, there may be a technical way to do that, um, and I'll let Christine weigh in. <laughs> yeah, so um, you can pay people with commodities, commodity wages, but otherwise, if you're just sort of bartering, it, you you really have to report that on a, a W-2, which seems kind of um, strange, but but true. You can't get away with "I'll do this for you, you do that for me," and nobody has to <laughs> no, nobody has to know any different. Um, it's still technically considered income that that you have to pay things on. Um, you have to be really careful about hiring people because IRS and there's a big push throughout the country right now. Now it might change with the change of administration, but there's been a really big push about um, uh, reclassifying. Uh, laborers as employees when they've been you know paid as independent contractors so if you have any control over them at all um, and, and there's a close call IRS is usually going to consider them to be employees so you got to be careful because you can be on the hook for employment taxes that um, you know that you might have to pay in addition to fines if you've misclassified a worker so if if you don't have the casual situation Matt talked about and you hire a kid for a whole summer you definitely need to consider that um, that labor to be an employee and, and follow all the the regulations that you need to follow um, you know farm if you're truly a farm worker you are exempt from like overtime provisions and things like that so that's helpful um, if you have to uh, if you have to file a W-2 or a 1099 this year, things have changed a little bit with the filing deadlines. So if you have workers that you've hired that you're reporting on this year, you've always had to give the um, W-2 or the 1099 to the employee or the contractor by, by January 31st. But this year the law has changed. You actually have to report to the Social Security Administration by January 31st as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and the same goes with Iowa Department of Revenue. They have a new January 31st deadline as well. So things are going to come early this year. So just be aware of that. Um, but great question. Uh, labor and employment is, is a huge thing, um, definitely. 
Um, I see one quick question from Mary that I want to address um, because it's it's important just to make sure it's clear. Um, she asked if you sell Section 179 items and have ordinary income, what form is it reported on? And is that self-employment income? Excellent question. Um, with 179, you report that also on Form 4797. You get a little different treatment in that if you only have to pay ordinary income taxes on the portion of the income that's because of the amount that you expensed under Section 179. Any other part of the income, you just have to pay capital gains tax on. So if your basis is zero, yes, you're going to have to pay ordinary income tax on the whole thing. But if your basis is, you know, $40,000 and um, you know, a portion of that was because of the Section 179. You only have to pay ordinary income tax on that on that portion of the income. And then the other thing that's that's key to know and, and helpful because it doesn't it doesn't quite sync up, and it's a good it's a good thing is that you do not have to pay self employment tax on that, um, even if you do have to pay ordinary income tax on the recapture of the Section 179. You do not owe SE tax on that. So that's a great question. Yeah, there have been some really great questions in here, and we've got time for a couple more. It looks like the only one that's lingering that we haven't uh, discussed was a question from Mike that said, um, do you need to show a profit within a certain time period to prove that you're not a hobby farm, and then what, what that profit would be? Just just to because you Oh, said, yeah, sure. that's it. That's a great question, and, and Matt might want to weigh in on that as well. There are regulations from IRS. Um, they're all very, um, nothing black and white. Um, I think, you know, it says like typically three out of five years, something like that. Um, but if you um, have this situation, I would advise that you um, you can email me and I can actually send you some resources of the detailed regulations that sort of give you the red flags that IRS uses. So if it's something you're dealing with, um, email me and I'll send you information on that. Um, otherwise, just know that it's it's not black and white, as most things with IRS are not, um, unfortunately. And if, and if I can weigh in, uh, pe what people have told me is, um, <clears throat> If you can lay out your books and it looks like you're you're intentionally farming to farm and making business choices that are increasing productivity that that you're that you're actually putting a lot of labor in on the farm that that it looks like you're actually farming um, it, it's that's a good that's a good benchmark it doesn't prove anything but it's when you lay out those books and it looks like you're hiding money. It looks like that you're that you're taking a lot of off-farm income and running it through the farm at a loss to kind of um, that's that's where the flags start f flying. So if you're if you're if you're being intentional about your farm, you're working with a professional to file your taxes. They should be able to give you some feedback about well, it looks like this could be a problem because you know. <laughs> It, it, the money's going into the farm, but it doesn't look like it's doing anything to actually generate either wealth or productivity or, or you know, that there was a catastrophic loss because of weather or something. It doesn't, that's kind of, it's, it's not black and white. And so that's why working with a professional helping you navigate that's really important. I, I do want to point out one little provision. I just got to thinking, I don't know how many of you um, are involved with farmers markets or things, but Matt was. And so um, I just want to raise that last year Congress did pass a new provision as part of the PATH Act. Um, in the past, if you had leftover produce or something that, that you had after your farmers market, and let's say you donated that to a food pantry, um, you wouldn't be able to take a charitable deduction on that because you would have zero basis in that um, commodity. But as part of the PATH Act, there was a change that a farmer, a cash basis farmer, can assign 25% of the fair market value of whatever you were selling that commodity for. So if it's sweet corn and you were selling it for a certain price, you can set your basis at 25% of the fair market value 
and you can actually take a charitable deduction for donating that produce to a farmer's market. So if you're in that, I mean, to a food pantry or a, or a qualified charity. So if you're in that business, it's a, it's a great new provision to sort of encourage charitable donations. And I think it'll help a lot of people. And the food just has to be um, apparently wholesome. So it, it can like not be your standard uh, looking food. Like maybe you couldn't sell it because it looked funny, but as long as it's wholesome, you can donate it and, and take a charitable de deduction. And that's a good provision. Wow, that is a really helpful bit of information. I don't, I don't think I've heard about that. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I think our looks like Kathy maybe has one final question here, and about feeding er, interns or volunteers. Uh, can those sorts of expenses uh, go under under labor? Or is there any way to get some kind of tax? Era. Mm. Yeah, so when you throw in the idea that they're interns or volunteers, it sort of throws everything into a uh, question. Like, I don't know, how do you score interns or volunteers working for you on the farm? Like interns, I think you could do that. Um, so I don't know your situation, but yeah, if they're, if they're laborers that are contributing to your um, farming operation and they're doing it for maybe the educational benefit or something like that but it's part of your business and they are there over lunch and you need to feed them in order to contribute to your business I think you could expense that um, but you know it would depend on the exact facts you'd have to talk through that with your with your tax preparer but if it's ordinary and necessary it can be a business expense Steve, if I could, I, I skipped over my slide on on the um, kind of our egg budget, and we don't need to go back to it. But I just call people's attention to that. That that slide was about. Um, oh, you've you've done that for me. Okay. Um, oh, you told me how to do this. Nope. This. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If you remember what the slide's called or what it says, that's easy, but. Yeah, I guess I didn't call it. It's right there. Um, this is just, record keeping is really, really vital and important, and I'm not very good at it. Um, I've gotten a lot better at it over the 12 years. Um, but one of the things is that if you keep good records, it's helpful for a whole bunch of reasons, taxes being one of the top reasons. but. Um, we hadn't really kept track of what it was costing us to do our eggs. We thought we were selling 4,000 dozen, $16,000 sales, you know, we, but when we actually took them, busted apart all those components, the, the cost of the refrigerator, the, the interest on the farm, all the things that you would run through it, you know, basically a, a tax accounting, when we got done and we really saw where we were not generating very much income from our eggs. <laughs> Um, and so then it, we raised our prices and did some things, but just that notion of, of, so it's in terms of retail agriculture, it's, it's, it's understanding how to price and the records to do that. But then it's also important for depreciation and tax purposes as well. But there's a link on that slide that, that really breaks out that whole kind of, um, you know, story of, of how we went through that and, and, and all of our line items for the budget for producing and selling the eggs. So I just want to call that um, out. Yeah, great. Thank you, Matt. And that hyperlink should work for all of you um, who want to click on it. Um, but that brings us right up to 8.30, and we have uh, exhausted the questions in the chat box. So I think this is a good time to wrap it up. Um, mm -hmm. I'd consider this a fantastic farminar. So thank you, Christine and Matt, for taking the time to do this for us. Really helpful stuff. Oh, thanks, you guys. You're a wonderful group. Yeah. So thank you for having us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks, everybody else, for joining us. Again, we'll be back next Tuesday uh, for a couple weeks in a row of cover crop topics. So those will be good stuff. And don't forget, if you haven't taken that survey, that'd be helpful for us. Thank you. <laughs>